Well, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Frank Yotso of the Center for Climate Economics and Policy here at the Crawford School. Um, before we start, just uh, let's acknowledge the first Australians on whose lands we meet. Uh, and also acknowledging, paying our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, um, the people past and present. Um, now, Climate Change Authority uh, is working on their first review of Australia's emissions caps and targets, the so-called caps and targets review. Um, of course, Australia has a uh, target range for 2020 of a 5 to 25 percent reduction relative to 2000 levels. Both major parties at this point in time are committed to that range. Um, the authority will recommend on, on a national emissions reduction target for 2020, as well as on an indicative pathway and budget for national emissions over time. And arguably that uh, over time aspect of it um, is a much bigger decision uh, in terms of the longer term policy settings uh, for Australia. So just some of the, the, the questions, I guess, that, uh, um, that uh, everyone who works in this field is grappling with. What might be Australia's fair share in a global effort? What, in fact, uh, is the global effort likely to be? Uh, should Australia calibrate its targets to the efforts and commitments made by other countries? If so, how? Uh, what should be the long-run ambition for Australia's uh, emissions, both net national emissions and domestic emissions? Um, and what are the implications from that decision about the long term uh, for the, for the short-term 2020 target? Um, and finally, something that I always like to highlight in that, in that context, um, how much of Australia's contribution to overall global emissions reductions uh, should take place at home uh, as distinct from uh, financial and other support for emission reductions uh, elsewhere. So we've got a very distinguished panel to discuss these, these issues here today. Uh, we have Anthea Harris, who is uh, these days the chief executive of Australia's Climate Change Authority. Uh, she's uh, worked uh, for quite some time on these and related issues. Uh, at the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, uh, where she played a leading role in the development of Australia's carbon pricing scheme, uh, including the, uh, the previous um, blueprint carbon pollution reduction scheme. Um, she was also involved in the, in the state-led um, uh, initiative uh, uh, before the, the Commonwealth came on board, uh, the National Emissions Trading Task Force, uh, and many other roles before that. Um, we will then hear from uh, Will McGoldrick, uh, who is Climate Change Policy Manager at WWF uh, Australia, uh, and uh, who, to many of you, uh, is also known in his former role with the Climate Institute. Um, and finally, Adjunct Professor Steve Hatfield-Dodds, who is uh, CSIRO's National Outlook Project Leader, uh, and who's also worked in this space for a very long time, uh, in various uh, roles for government, including Department of Climate Change, Energy Efficiency, and Treasury earlier as well, if I remember correctly. Uh, and I think Steve would like to point out that um, he's not wearing his CSIRO hat uh, in, in making his comments here today. So we've got until uh, 1.45. Uh, I anticipate that uh, the majority of that time, in fact, will be available to us for question and answer and discussion, so we'll really have the opportunity to get into some of the nooks and crannies uh, on, these, uh, on these topics. Uh, we'll kick off uh, with Anthea's presentation, so uh, let's make her feel welcome. I would like to thank, uh, thank Frank Yotso and uh, the Crawford School very much for giving the opportunity to have this discussion today. It's very much appreciated. So as Frank said, um, the Climate Change Authority is conducting its first review of the caps and, tar of caps and targets for Australia. Mm. There we go. Not all of you will know who exactly the Climate Change Authority is, so I thought I'd give you a brief outline. We're a new body. We're only established on the 1st of July last year. We're an independent statutory agency. And our um, job is to provide independent advice to the government uh, about climate change mitigation policies and what those mitigation policies should be aiming for. So what level of um, mitigation ambition should Australia be thinking about? 
We report to the Climate Change Minister and, and therefore through him to Parliament. All of our work is very transparent though. So when we provide our reports, we provide them to the Minister, but then immediately our legislation requires us to make them available to the public. So it's, they don't go into a bottom drawer somewhere never to be seen again. They are very, very transparent. Uh, our independence is enshrined in our legislation. The Minister can give us directions that are of a broad nature only and cannot direct us in terms of the conduct or content of our reviews. Uh, this is who the authority members are. So I'm the CEO, I look after the staff. The staff and the money is my, is my job. Here are the authority members. So Bernie Fraser is our chair, probably needs no introduction. Uh, Professor Ian Chubb, next along the line, is the Australia's chief scientist. He's an ex-officio member of the committee. Then we have Lynn Williams, she's an economist um, from Victoria. Uh, then we have John Marley, who's had a long history, really a sort of a heavy industry uh, perspective, particularly in aluminium. Then we have Professor John Quiggin, who's another economist. He's an academic based in Queensland. Then we have Heather Riddout, who many of you probably uh, know best from um, previously being the head of the uh, Australian Industry Group. And then we have Professor Clive Hamilton. So Clive has been an academic and a writer and an author and a social commentator on a number of issues, including climate change, uh, and is former founder and um, former head of the Australia Institute. Then we have Alana Rubin, who brings a really a finance background perspective. So she's got a long uh, career in um, various places in the finance industry, particularly in superannuation. Uh, and finally, Professor David Caroli, who is a climate change scientist. So it is, by design, uh, a very mixed group. Um, and they do have the sorts of uh, lively discussions that you they were meant to have. <laughs> So in terms of the authorities work program, uh, just to let you know what we do, we've got scheduled reviews for all the major um, policies that we have in place. We've got reg regular scheduled reviews locked in to legislation. So we finished our first review of the renewable energy target in December last year. We're currently scheduled to do that every two years. Uh, we recommended that that was a bit much and that perhaps four years might be a more sensible time frame. But currently, it was the legis legislation stands, we'll be doing another review of the um, renewable energy target next year. Uh, we've got our caps and targets review due in, um, in the 28th of February next year and it'll incorporate technically a separate report on progress towards meeting um, our targets. The end of next year we have to do, um, by then we have to do a review of the carbon farming initiative, so Australia's domestic offsets program. Uh, and then 2016 we're due to do a review of the whole Clean Energy Act, uh, in particular the, clean, uh, the carbon pricing mechanism. Uh, another progress report, they happen every year. Another caps and targets review from 2016 onwards, they happen every year. Uh, and another rep review. Okay. So about this review. Under the, under the mechanism for the carbon pricing mechanism, um, they need to set five years worth of caps uh, in a in, a, um, in one block and thereafter you extend it out by one year. So at, at an absolute minimum, we have, it's really hard to think about what those caps should be to get us out to 2019-20. So for the first five years of the flexible price period under the carbon pricing mechanism, hard to think what those caps for the emissions trading scheme should be, unless you've got an idea about where you want to be by 2020 and what kind of shape of the line, you know, what shape of the pathway you want for national emissions to get there. So we need to make recommendations about caps for the Emissions Training Scheme. Because we're doing that, we'll make recommendations about a target for 2020. We'll make recommendations about a trajectory to get there. We're also required to make recommendations about a carbon budget. Now, the legislation is rather vague on this point. It just defines carbon budget as an amount of greenhouse gas emissions emitted over a period. It doesn't define the period, and that's actually something we're very keen to hear people's views on, about over what period does it make sense to set a carbon budget. Um, just to be very, very clear, this is a view about uh, Australia's targets and its level of ambition in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's not a review of the carbon pricing mechanism. It's not a review of uh, the details of any policy carbon pricing mechanism compared with any other policies that you might imagine. That's not this review. So when we're conducting this review, we're not starting entirely from a blank sheet of paper. So in our legislation, so in the Clean Energy Act, one of the objects of the Act is to reduce Australia's net greenhouse gas emissions by 80% below 2000 levels by 2050. 
And there's also a minimum commitment um, by Australia to reduce um, emissions by at least 5% compared with 2000 levels by 2020. So in relation um, to the commitment for 5% by 2020, we're taking that as a minimum. There's no point us looking, we're not going to be looking at um, potential targets that are less ambitious than that because it is an undertaking for Australia and if the government were to accept our recommendations, it would involve Australia sort of breaching its international obligations, which doesn't make much sense. Uh, we also will take into account the fact that the government has a target range, so between 5 and 15% or 25%, basically depending on the level, scale and pace of international action. We will take that into account, indeed we must take it into account, uh, but we're not bound by that. So that we, we have a long list of things we must take into account. So our job is not solely just to interpret the, the existing government's target range and conditions. Uh, just to put what they, the existing target range, bearing in mind, not binding on us, but what that actually looks like, uh, just on impact. So you can see that blue line is where Australia's actual emissions have been tracking, and you can see 80% um, target and those um, 5, 15 and 25 where they sit. Uh, it's drawn for the sake of convenience in straight lines. There is no magic about straight lines for any of those things. Now, just so we're all on the same page on terminology, this can be quite helpful. Uh, when we're talking about targets, we're talking about the dot, so the single year point in time target. When we're talking about a trajectory, we're talking about a shape of a pathway, the line to get there. There's no magic in straight lines. We tend to draw them because they're easy to draw. There's no magic in a straight line. Because the emissions trading scheme, the carbon pricing mechanism, only covers about 60% of national emissions, when we're talking about the cap, for the emissions trading scheme, we're talking about a subset of national emissions and that whole, um, uh, that whole, what we could think of as a carbon budget, that area under that curve. And when we're thinking about the cap, we have to make sure that there's, we've left allowed room for uncovered sector emissions. So key matters that we're going to be looking at. Uh, they are really summarised here, the sorts of things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be taking it as given that um, the fact that it is in Australia's national interest to support global action to limit global warming to no more than two degrees. So we are not conducting a big cost-benefit analysis on whether this is a good idea from a global perspective or from Australia's perspective. We're not going to be trying to recreate the Stern Review or the Garner Review. We're taking that as accepted. So once we've taking that into account, then it leads you to think about, well, if that's the global task at hand, what do the scientists tell us about how many emissions the world has got left, how many emissions can the world emit and still keep to those, have a reasonable probability of it keeping to those goals? That immediately thinks, well, if that's the global task, what's our share of all of that? What should we be doing? We'll also be having a look at international action. What are other countries doing? Uh, what does that mean for us? Where do we think we should be sitting in this pecking order? You'll notice there's a little double-headed arrow there between our targets and international action, deliberately reflecting the place, the fact that we know we, like every other country, looks at everybody else as they're thinking about what targets they will make. So everybody looks at everybody else and, um, and can have an influence. We'll be looking at carefully at the economic and social implications of any recommendations that we'll make. Put all that together to come to judgments about recommendations for targets, trajectories and budgets, uh, and then make recommendations about caps. So, as I said, we have to think about this issue of, well, if we're taking seriously the goal of no more than two degrees, and we have to think about we, um, looking uh, to scientists to provide advice to us on what that might mean for global carbon budgets. How many emissions has the world got left available to it to give a reasonable probability of sticking below two degrees? Uh, now, this, um, this, this particular drawing is just here for the, to make the obvious point that if you have a global carbon budget, you've only got so many emissions you can emit over time, the area under the curve of all of these these three curves is the same, but you can see that, just making the very obvious point, if you spend more of your budget early, you have to make sharper reductions later. And so uh, it's just an inexorable um, mathematical fact that we do need to um, bear in mind as we're thinking about, uh, thinking about what we might be doing and how we might be trying to support global action to, to meet that goal.
So once we thought about what the global task at hand is, you immediately think, well, what's our share of this kind of global budget? Um, and we're saying this not because we think it's an easy matter of find your favourite formula, put in the numbers, and then that's necessarily the end of the matter. So we, there's a list of things that we must and will, of course, consider when we're making our recommendations. But we do want whatever we recommend. The Australian government, we'd like them to accept our recommendations, and we'd like them to take that recommendation into international negotiations. And so when our negotiators, uh, someone of whom has just walked in the door, <laughs> they're sitting across the table from our counterparts from, from other countries, and trying to encourage them to take on um, more action, which is in our national interest, we need to be doing that. We need to make sure that we're sitting in a position of strength to going into those negotiations to be persuasive and credible and someone that someone will listen to. So various um, authors of different kinds, so countries and think tanks and, and particular authors have come up with all sorts of different ways about thinking about this issue of how might you fairly divide up whatever global carbon budget um, you're, you're talking about. And dip, there's all sorts of different methodologies for this, ideas that people have had. So some focus on capability. So in particular, if you're a rich country or in, with good institutions, that you might, you should be responsible for, um, uh, you should be responsible for greater emissions reductions. Some look at responsibility, in particular historical responsibility, so looking in the past, uh, how many of the emissions in the atmosphere already were you responsible for, and if you were responsible for a lot of them, you should be reducing your emissions more quickly. Some look at equality, in particular emissions per capita, that maybe everyone should have equal rights to uh, emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Some of those methodologies say, well, that should be from tomorrow. Some of them say, well, it's probably not very realistic. Perhaps some time in the future that eventually people could track towards having emis equal emissions rights per capita. They're, those methodologies are about emissions rights, not actual emissions per capita. And there could be trade, which leads to different outcomes. Uh, and finally, access to sustainable development. So a lot of these methodologies make sure that, um, that uh, poorer countries, particularly least developed countries, have got some sort of headroom so that they can actually develop, not necessarily in the emissions intensive way that our countries developed, but, but they can actually develop a decent standard of living. So that brings us to international action. We will, of course, and we're required to have a look at what other countries uh, are doing. So we're going to be really looking at this from two perspectives. We'll be looking at the pledges that countries have made. So, and um, more than 90 countries have made pledges covering more than 80% of the global emissions. So we'll be taking those pledges into account. We'll also be looking at what countries are doing on the ground, what kind of policies are in place that would lead you to, um, to give you some confidence about those pledges actually um, coming into being. So we'll be looking at both of those aspects. Once you've collected all that information, though, of course, then what do you do with it? <laughs> this is a, a key issue for this review. Who, who should we be comparing ourselves to and why? So once you've got all this information, what do you do with it? Where do you think Australia should sit? What are the relevant comparisons? Um, presumably, we don't think, uh, you know, our, our sensible compa you know, comparator might necessarily be Mozambique, for example. Are they going to be a key indicator of what we do? Most people, I think, would say no. Who, who are the relevant comparators and why? So, and there's different ways you can think about this. So, should it be um, major emitters that we're most concerned with? Should it be our trade competitors? Should it be our trading partners? Um, should it be countries with a similar standard of living as us? There's a range of things to think about there. So then we'll be having a look at the economic and social implications of anything that we recommend. Um, there will, of course, be the mandatory large modelling exercise, which will be conducted uh, in conjunction with Treasury and the Department, and, um, but it's a collective effort. So there's, there's going to be some modelling that's going to be potentially used uh, for multiple purposes um, throughout, that, throughout that process. Uh, we will, of course, be... The, what we'll be having to look at is a range of targets. So we're reporting on the relative uh, costs and benefits of different targets um, at different and trajectories and carbon budgets, all of that, um, at, at different levels. So things that we'll be looking at um, are, of course, things like changes to those overall kind of macroeconomic indicators, what happens to our GDP, what happens to our gross national income, what we think happens to the structure of our economy, what happens at a more micro level, what do we think happens in the electricity industry, what do we think happens to electricity prices, for example. Um, so we'll be looking at all of those things. 
So finally, we need to bundle that all together and come to judgments about what appropriate um, targets and trajectories and carbon budgets might be, and then recommend uh, uh, matching um, caps for the emissions trading scheme. Uh, one of the things that um, we're keen to get feedback on is the nature of guidance beyond 2020. So the authority wants to say something about life beyond 2020, and it's a matter of what. <laughs> and there are a number of options here. So ranging from very, very simple kind of options of why don't you recommend another couple of point targets, you know, 20, 25 point target or, or 2030 point target, might be a long-term carbon budget, for example, a carbon budget all the way from here to 2050, for example, saying, well, here's your budget, spend it how you like, but that's the budget, out to 2050. Other people take carb, um, approach carbon budgets in a different manner. For example, in the UK, they have kind of rolling five-year carbon budgets that currently gets them out to 2027, so it doesn't go all the way to 2050, but they add on chunks at a regular interval. Another option is to think about which gives you different carbon budgets, but and another way of thinking about it is to think of different um, targets and trajectories, a range of those things, um, and you might track to one end of the range or to the other end of the range under different circumstances. And so if you think there are sort of, you want to have sort of future flexibility and options, but provide guidance about that, what are the relevant criteria that we should be signalling in advance that what sorts of things would you want to take into account to go to one end of a range compared with the other? Um, so that's actually a key issue for this review that we're particularly keen to get um, stakeholder feedback on. So uh, the other review, technically it's a separate review, we have to report every year on progress towards meeting our targets. Now, I must admit, we had quite a bit of discussion internally about what this meant, because it, we, at, the, at, at its very sort of simplest, uh, progress towards meeting targets, we thought, well, the department already publishes our inventory, so we can see where emissions have actually been going, uh, and already publishes projections, so they already provide estimates of where I think our emissions are heading. So we thought, well, presumably we're not allowed to just repackage that and put, out and put our own logo on it. So we thought, right, what else could we possibly be adding to this? And we've really come up with three ideas. The first idea is to have a look backwards to see what that can tell us about the future. Um, in particular, on the our energy sector, we can see in the electricity sector that electricity demand has been falling uh, quite a bit in recent times, and we can also see that uh, emissions intensity has fallen a bit uh, in recent times. So we'd like everyone I think that you speak to about this issue kind of agrees on what the likely causes are, but I think there's less agreement on the size of the contributions of those of those particular items. So data willing, we're going to try and have a go uh, at, at putting some numbers on that. Um, we also, from a broader um, economy point of view, looking backwards, we can see trends in our overall emissions, but we'd like to sort of strip out some underlying trends. So how much of the change in our emissions intensity of our whole economy has just been a matter of structural, ongoing structural change in our economy? How much is cyclical? You can actually see quite a strong cyclical trend in our, in our emissions. So we're taking those things away. What do we think un, un, underlying trends in our emissions intensity of our economy really are? Um, so that's thing number one, backward looking. Then we thought about thing number two, which is, which is forward looking. Now, we thought, well, if we progress, what can that mean? We don't come from this from a kind of a central planning point of view that we know exactly what the, the optimal path is towards any longer term target, and, uh, and we know exactly what investments must happen when. We, we don't think that. But, however, we do look around the world at all sorts of um, modelling that all sorts of people do and estimates of what the world would need to look like to be in a below two degree world. What sorts of things would the world need to be looking like by 2050? And if you have a look, you know, some obvious candidates might be things like CCS can play, you know, often plays a starring role in a lot of these modelling exercises, for example. So working backwards, if that's... If people think that might be the case in 2050, working backwards, what kind of milestones would you need to see to be to feel like you might be on track towards that, or when might you start to think, start to worry that actually that's not actually going to occur? So, um, other people in this process have been suggesting sort of more enabling sort of factors, like we might want to think about things like levels of skills. Is that something we want to track as a sort of leading indicator for um, future future changes? or looking at innovation in the broad, rather than specific technologies, but levels of innovation. Is that something we should be tracking? So ideas there, gratefully welcomed. Uh, and finally, 
this is an issue which we thought there was a national conversation occurring anyway about this particular issue, so we wanted to really corral it and discuss it all in one place. And that is this whole issue of net targets. So when we're talking about net targets, so we have a target, but actually you can buy international permits into that and that counts towards meeting your target. It all doesn't have to happen here in the country. And people have different views about um, the merits or otherwise of that. Uh, and so um, we want to, to have a discussion about that, really sort of to facilitate, I suppose, a national discussion about that. Uh, so we want to talk about what might be the advantages uh, and any potential risks associated with that approach. Uh, again, we're not making recommendations about any scheme design in this review. That's not what, what we're doing. But we thought it was relevant to this whole discussion about progress. What does progress mean? Unless you have kind of fairly clear ideas about that, it's hard to think about. The timelines for our review, we've put out our issues paper on the 23rd of May. There's our website there, so if you haven't had a look, I encourage you to do so. Submissions are due on the 30th of May. We'll put out a draft report in October. Um, don't go on holidays in November because your submissions will be due at the end of November. And our final report is due on the 28th of February next year. Thank you. Thanks for having me along today and thanks Frank and thanks to the Crawford School. It's good to see the Crawford School still sort of playing such a leading role in facilitating these sorts of discussions. It's great. It's uh, well appreciated by all of us. Um, so before I dive into some comments and discussion around the Climate Authority's review, I just wanted to make some, um, some preliminary uh, comments around the state of the debate in Australia on, on climate change. And I'm going to do this to a, a series of beautiful images. Um, so in my view, the climate change debate in Australia has become one that's been overly focused on cost. Cost to the economy, cost to industry, cost to individual companies, cost to the local footy club, cost to you and me. Casual observers of the debate would, wouldn't, you know, could be excused for believing that this is what it was all about and, and not realise that in fact the costs are quite manageable and in fact we're getting something fairly large in return. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that a debate around the cost of one policy or another isn't important. In fact, it's a crucial part of the story. But in my view, it's just one of the, it's one subplot in a much larger narrative that Australia needs to be having on this issue of climate change. This is a story about why bold and ambitious action on climate change is important. Why are we doing this? What are we trying to achieve? Within this larger story, the story about costs becomes just one subplot. I think most of you probably agree, um, even from industry side, that in Australia we've sort of completely lost the plot in the last few years on climate change for various reasons. So when I was preparing for this presentation, I was trying to figure out how can I ensure that I don't also get lost in that, those, those individual subplots and try and keep us focused a little bit more on the, bigger, on the bigger story and at what's at stake. So my solution was basically to put together a series of um, beautiful images from around the world. WWF has a great photo library, so I just spend a few hours trawling through it, grabbing nice images. And you'll notice I've got images of people and places um, to remind us that it's not just about people or places, it's about both. Hopefully you can remain focused on the bigger picture in case I get lost in some of the subplots. So the first and most crucial subplot from my point of view and from WWF's point of view is the science. As many of you will know, last week we crossed over the 400 parts per million mark for CO2 in the atmosphere. Strangely enough, this happened on my birthday, so I immediately jumped online to see where uh, CO2 was back in whenever I was born. Uh, and it was sitting at 340 parts per million. The nerds in the room will be able to work out how old I am now. Um, so in other words, uh, since I was born, CO2 emissions have increased by about uh, 20% over the last 34 years, I won't hide my age. Over the same period, global mean temperatures have increased by more than about a half a degree. This got me thinking, inevitably, as a parent does, about my son, Isaac, who's five. Isaac will turn uh, 34 in 2042. If we believe current projections, he'll be breathing in air that has CO2 levels at about 500 parts per million, with global temperatures about two degrees above uh, the historical average. And worse will still come. Under this scenario, uh, warming will increase, uh, sorry, we'll see global warming rise to about 3.7, between 3.7 and 5.6 degrees by 2100. So, in other words, when Isaac's own children are having their children, things will be looking fairly grim. Luckily, this subplot, the science, also tells us the good news. The good news is that it's not yet too late. So, 
for Isaac's sake, that's great, but for all of us as well, I'm sure, I think uh, um, we all want to live in a, in a safe climate. So the challenge for the international community is to ensure that we stay within a safe uh, carbon budget. Um, a landmark study was published back in 2009 in Nature by a group of uh, well-known and respected scientists, including Australia's own Bill Hare. Uh, this study showed that to maintain a 75% chance of avoiding two degrees of warming, Australia's, uh, sorry, the global carbon budget between 2000 and 2050 must be contained to the equivalent of about 1,500 gigatons of CO2. If you're willing to reduce the probability, uh, so take on a bit more risk of staying below two degrees, down to, say, to bring that probability down to 50%, you can increase the budget to about 2,000 gigatons of CO2. In 2011, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology arrived at a similar set of numbers, concluding that at current rates of emissions, the world would consume the entire carbon budget by around 2032, much earlier if the aim is to increase our chance of staying below two degrees. The 2032 um, estimate is based on a 50% chance of staying below two degrees. Um, as many of you will be aware, the debate so far has been focused around the 2020 target. Um, which is obviously really important. A 2020 target for Australia is crucial, but it's really encouraging to see the authority sort of being tasked with that opportunity to broaden the discussion out to discuss carbon budgets as opposed to just a single year uh, number. And this is something that a lot of environment groups and others pushed hard for um, uh, to get into the legislation. So it's really encouraging to see. As Anthony's already touched on, there's two aspects to this discussion around a, a, what is a safe global carbon budget. Um, sorry, uh, there's two aspects to this discussion. One is, what is a safe carbon budget? How do you define that? And, and obviously you look to the science. The second is to decide how that budget should be shared between, between countries. As I've outlined, the science should be the guiding uh, principle or guiding source of information um, to help the authority in its, its deliberations. Uh, in our view, a safe climate budget is one that maximises the chances of keeping global warming below two degrees and doesn't rule out the possibility of uh, keeping warming below 1.5 degrees. Now, keeping warming to below 1.5 degrees obviously seems incredibly ambitious, given, given where we're at, um, but it's important to acknowledge that internationally, the community, international community has said that they've considered reviewing the global goal from two degrees to 1.5 degrees. And I think most of us have to acknowledge that a two degree target isn't particularly the most optimal uh, level of warming that we should be aiming for, particularly if you're living in a low lying or vulnerable, particularly vulnerable country. So while the science is crucial and it needs to be at the core of what the authority does, um, the other crucial subplot, in my view, is this question of equity. So any decision around a, a carbon budget for Australia or a, car, or a target or whatever else inherently uh, has considerations of, of equity, or e even if you don't, don't realise it. So even if a politician doesn't realise it, realize it, they are making judgments about, about equity. Uh, the authority in its discussion paper, and I encourage you going to have a read it, provides quite a useful sort of introduction to that debate and that discussion. I don't want to try and rehash and go into all of it here today. Um, I just want to emphasise that it is crucially important. What it does is it, it basically means that it, it presents us with a situation where we should be forcing, well, the authority hopefully, through its advice and its analysis, will be forcing our political leaders, but also all of us, to ask these sort of ethical questions, such as, should the average Australian have a greater share of the global carbon budget than the average person in Bangladesh, for example? Or should we be given greater access to, our, to the budget than our children or our children's children? So these questions start to become at the forefront of decision making and deliberations around targets, which is crucial because to date I don't think there's been enough of that, although the Garneau review, of Frank, which Frank worked hard on, um, did, did go into that in some detail as well. So obviously it forces our political leaders, or at least makes them, uh, hopefully makes them mindful of these issues. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily dictate how they'll, the decision they'll finally make. Uh, if the government then ignores the authority's advice, uh, hopefully what is uh, uh, advice that's based on the science and these considerations of equity, then it's up to the government then to explain to the people uh, and to all of us why they've erred away from, from that advice. And that's the crucial thing about the authority and its place and its role it can play in the debate, provided it does play that role in a very rigorous science-based way. Um, if the authority appears not to be acting in an independent way, 
without fear or favour, then obviously its credibility gets diminished. And I don't think there's anything to suggest that's the, that's the case now. Um, so, before I finish up on, on those, there's two other subplots I'll just touch on briefly. One is what's happening internationally, and the other is the economics, obviously, which is the, the subplot we've been obsessed with today. So, obviously, in Australia, there's, there is a tendency to lose sight of what's happening internationally. Anthea pointed out it will be part of the authorities' consideration. Uh, and when the international scene does come into the media in Australia, it's generally about the, the negative stories, the collapse of Copenhagen, the collapse of the EU price, the failure of the US to pass legislation. The reality is the story is a lot more complicated uh, and there's, surprisingly, quite a lot of positive science out there as well. Um, and I won't go into all of those in, in detail. Um, it, I'm not suggesting that the combined effort of, of, of countries around the world is enough to stay below two degrees. Far from it. We're still tracking, as I said before, to something well above that. But there's some really positive signs. And I'll just touch on what's happening in China. So China, yes, is the biggest emitter, but it's also a, a global renewable energy superpower now. It's got more renewable energy installed than any other nation, approximately one-fifth of the global total. In 2011 alone, China installed an estimated 18 gigawatts of non-hydro renewable, plus another 12 gigawatts of hydro. At this rate, China is adding the equivalent of Australia's entire national electricity market in renewable energy every 20 months. It's just a pretty sort of hard thing to fathom how quickly it's happening. Interestingly, Australia is also benefiting from this boom in, in China, with the rapid growth in Chinese solar manufacturing driving down the cost of solar panels for Australia. So we talk about, in international negotiations, technology transfer and the role of developed countries providing technology to developing countries. In fact, at the moment, it's probably happening the other way around, which is quite an interesting, uh, interesting little uh, quirk. Yes, China's still building new coal fire stations, but they're also closing the old and inefficient ones down, uh, reportedly at a rate of around one plant every couple of weeks, although I will say I, I've, I've read that in the newspapers and haven't actually got a figure on it myself, so uh, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, China's trialling regional renewable energy schemes, um, which together will account for one third of China's GDP and one fifth of the country's total energy use. And at the international level, China has pledged to reduce emission, the emissions intensity of its economy by 40 to 45 per cent below 2005 levels by 2020. So what's happening in China and other countries does matter for Australia. According to analysis by the Department of Climate Change obtained under Freedom of Information by the Climate Institute, my former employer, China's target is consistent with the conditions that Australia set for moving to a 25% target. So just looking at China on its own, there's quite an important revelation there. So that was the bureaucrats providing advice on where Australia's target matches up. Looking beyond China, Ross Garneau recently argued that at the very least the conditions have been met for Australia to move to a 15% minimum target, so lift its 5% to a 15%. Um, and indeed, uh, Ross Garneau argued that Australia should in fact be willing to go to a 17% target to match the US. Needless to say, WWF would argue that if we're going to go to 17, we may as well go the whole hog and go for 25% uh, at least uh, as, as, our, as our, our target. Um, it's worth noting here that some concerns have been raised about uh, the Climate Change Authority's um, acceptance of Australia's 80% target for 2050. And these concerns are quite valid and it's, a, it's something which WWF uh, is also concerned about. And it does seem obviously weird to be too preoccupied with a 2050 target given how far away that is, but it's important for a couple of reasons. The first reason obviously is what target you set for 2050 has implications for the, the, what targets you you're going to take on in the nearer term. It, it, it helps to shape the curve between now and, and there. So you immediately start to, if you, if you take a low 2050 target, you start to imply potentially lower levels of action uh, at the earlier stages. If you take a deeper target, you start to imply higher levels of action or a really, really steep curve later on in the piece. Secondly, the 2050 target sends a really important signal internationally. And we saw this in Copenhagen. We saw uh, the developed countries in Copenhagen attempt to adopt a 2050 target which was blocked by China. And at the time in the media this was reported as you know, China blocking progress, China getting in the way of, of targets. It was later revealed that China had, been, had done its own number crunching and had established that uh, the targets that were being proposed would have effectively locked in uh, what they saw as inequitable uh, per capita emissions 
uh, for decades to come. So the differential between China and developed countries would be unacceptable in their terms, which brings us back to this question of equity. So a 2050 target that's not consistent with your objectives from an equity point of view uh, sends the rock signal internationally. So we urge the authority to take a second look, fresh-eyed look at the, at the 2050 targets and what's, what's important. And just quickly, because Frank's probably wanting me to wind up, um, on the economics, all I'd really say here, and I had some, some more notes that I was going to go through, but just quickly I'd say is that I think, coming back to my original comment, where we've been obsessed with the cost, our view is that the authority has an opportunity here to broaden the conversation around the economics. What are the potential benefits for Australia of going early on emissions reduction? What new industries might be created? What are the risks of Australia's economy being too tied up in a potentially dangerous carbon bubble? What are th these sorts of questions, I think, haven't featured strongly enough in the debate in Australia. So let's, just as we have the debate around the cost to the local footy club, let's start having this debate around those long-term uh, potential risks and opportunities for our economy. And um, WWF will be certainly taking up that challenge in, in the coming months with some research we'll be releasing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And I think we're continuing along the lines of the, of the economics, where we'll, we'll left off. Um, Steve's slides, I think, are here somewhere. Steve Hatfield Dodds. Thanks very much, Frank, and thanks to the Crawford School. And my apologies to all of you that my visual skill is much lower than either Anthea's or, or Will's. I can't even find the right button to get the slideshow to start. The first is it's not well understood that there's uh, an emerging and now very strong consensus in the economics community uh, about the benefits of, of global action. So most people remember the, the uh, lights in action uh, after the Stern review where Stern came out with this report and it was really dramatic and immediately, you know, all the big end of town from the economics profession came out and said, you know, this Stern guy, he's crazy. Um, so that was 2006, 2007, and then by the time you get to 2010, all the people, all the people disagreeing with him have secretly sort of quietly come around <coughs> to agree with him, uh, but for various professional reasons, have not made a big fuss about now agreeing with him and changing their mind. Uh, and so you have this very strong consensus. Uh, there, is, there is one exception who afterwards you can ask me uh, what I think of his work, um, but, but the big names, uh, are now all clear that uh, two degrees provides net economic benefits uh, from their, their technical analysis. Um, but a word of caution it, it comes back to this graph. So this graph represents the analysis as it was in 2006, 2007. Uh, and it points to the fact that very highly trained economists sometimes don't focus on the most sensible thing. So this graph, this is the uh, the net cost uh, of climate change relative to a world that we'd like to live in which doesn't have climate change and so you don't need to mitigate. And the, the whole argument between Stern and Nordhaus, which is shown here, is Stern saying we should be aiming for something below 550 parts per million, so down here about uh, probably 530, uh, because that's the, the point closest to this line. And Nordhaus arguing, no, you've got that completely wrong, we should be aiming for about 740 parts per million, because look at this massive difference in cost. You're saving yourself 0.6% of global GDP by <laughs> allowing you know, a temperature increases of about 8 degrees, uh, rather than temperature increases of about 3.2 3 degrees. <coughs> so neither of them now adhere to those lines, but that was, the, was what the argument was about. Uh, and it really is a little strange at times. Um, I'll put that aside and, and go on to, to much more interesting economics, i.e. my publication, um, which is, I just put up because the title, you know, in this case, is truth in advertising. You know, what the science is telling us now, what the economic analysis tell, is telling us now, is it's all in the timing. So this is a, a common piece that I wrote on somebody else who'd done the hard work, so it was great. They probably had about uh, 70 or 80, um, you know, person months to do their work and I took three days to write a nice little comment piece. Um, and they'll probably get more citations. Um, but the, the key thing that they find buried down in here is that 
if you assume the world is on track to sort of take some standard action from 2020, uh, and that's where the global negotiations are going, I think that would be an optimistic uh, reading, but a face value reading of what the negotiations say. Uh, if we brought forward uh, substantial global action from 2020 to 2015, uh, it would cost less than half as much. Okay? Or you can translate that into probability terms. So, second key insight from economics is that the politics isn't being very economically sensible. You know, the earlier we can act and the more decisively we can act, the, the lower the risks are to the planet and, and the, the lower the, the cost is of achieving that. So it's very good um, insurance. The, the third big insight from the economics that I would like to point out is, is in part uh, economics like most uh, disciplines uh, likes to say things where it's got the tools to do it. All right? And so the first test is what do our tools allow us to explore? Uh, and then the second step is, what can we say about those things? Right? Neither of those steps say, what's the most important thing? Or, uh, what are the most material things we should be exploring? Uh, and so you need to look in the, uh, at the sort of noise to signal ratio here. So economics has really good models for analysing you know, abatement costs and technology costs and predicting technology costs out into the future. FIRO has one of the best ones around at the moment. We're better than the US EPA, so that's important. Um, but, but where are the weak single issues? Where are the issues in economics uh, that aren't being uh, properly explored uh, uh, because of limits to quantification, limits to what we can say? And uh, so there, there are three, uh, three areas I would, I, would, I would mention there. The first is that there's real prospects um, that uh, well-implemented energy efficiency programs uh, could end up uh, putting you into net benefit space. Okay, so that uh, instead of a cost frame dialogue about how much lower is global GDP uh, with substantial emissions action, you might be talking how much higher uh, is GDP. Uh, and you could fairly go on and say if you can achieve that energy efficiency and do it with dirty coal, you know, you could be doing even better. But a lot of this the presumption and the framing is important so that uh, energy efficiency could deliver net benefits at, at um, a global scale. The second thing is that the, the society-wide rates of return on innovation are so high um, that if a substantial effort on uh, climate change crowds in the innovation, okay, so if having uh, an ambitious global action agreement uh, and so people spend more on R&D than they would otherwise spend, or if companies spend more time thinking about how to be smarter than they would otherwise spend. Um, uh, if it's not diversion, is the point I'm making. If you're not simply diverting effort from developing new iPhones into developing low emissions technologies, uh, you would almost be certain to get an increase in global GDP. And that shows up in some of the, the models, particularly a special edition that, that Mark wrote there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and, and so we need to be cautious about you know, what we know and, and what we don't, don't know. And then moving from the economics to the, to the science, and this is my, my last slide. Um, the science is clear, as we've already mentioned, that the sorts of agreements under sort of Copenhagen, Cancun, and Durban uh, uh, have what we might quite describe as an ambition. Okay? They're not on track uh, to two degrees. They're not really on track to anything that's very close to two degrees. Um, but this is uh, a nature publication that came out in 2010, uh, shortly after the Copenhagen Agreement. Um, and the reason I put it up is because they, they took the range of commitments and tracked them through, and that was their answer. You've got an 80% chance of exceeding 2.5 degrees with those, those uh, commitments. Um, oh, sorry, 80% chance up here. Um, <coughs> Uh, but if you included a global target, um, and the form and substance of that target uh, would be difficult to frame, but just in numbers terms, a global target that's in the order of halving global emissions, uh, you get down to here to a, something like a 50% chance of two degrees. Uh, so I'm not saying that because I have any particular fondness or sympathy for that particular <coughs> target, uh, but just making the point that what happens in 2020 is only useful from this perspective as a step uh, in a journey. And part of the reason I raise it is in terms of the international negotiations, 
it, it seems to take us quite a while to get to agreement. Um, and so I would be concerned about leaving uh, the, the beginning of a discussion about a 2050 target to, say, 2030, um, because then we could probably agree the 2050 target by 2080. Um, so, so I think that, that needs attention now. So they're, they're my slides, and then I'd like to talk about what I'm here to talk about, which is <coughs> what are the considerations in framing a 2020 target? So, so Anthony has already sort of uh, summarised the national interest statement that it's Australia's <coughs> national interest to, to, to aim for two degrees or, or better. Um, I'm still old fashioned and refer to the, the stabilisation targets of 450 parts per million or lower. Now, if that's, if that's why Australia is engaging in the international negotiations and that's why we're setting a target, because Australia is a small country and can do very little, sort of unilaterally or by itself, um, <clears throat> for me that implies that the principal aim of engagement in the target negotiations and uh, international negotiations is to encourage greater action. And so my primary lens about what's a good target, what's a bad target, uh, the, the key test is what encourages international ambition. And a very secondary issue is, you know, how do we make sure that we don't uh, do too much? How do we make sure we don't contribute too much or pay more than our share uh, for global action? And that's partly because of my, uh, my intuition or my hunch on the sort of cost-benefit ratios at play here, that the cost to, the benefits to Australia uh, of successful action might be 10 times as much as the cost to Australia. Uh, so, so if we pay 12% more than we should, the benefits might fall down to you know, eight times as large or something. Um, but the, the weight and the impetus uh, in the international negotiations uh, are certainly not as a crowd of countries rushing forward to pay too much. Okay? The weight and the impetus in the international negotiations is there's a crowd of countries standing at the back of the room waiting for other people to move forward. So I think it would be much clearer for us to focus on lifting ambition. Um, and then in practice, what, is, what does that mean? I would argue that the, the tactical goal for Australia is to maximise the incentive of the USA, sorry, the, the incentive of the EU and the USA to lift their ambition uh, because their targets as currently stated are the ones that are on the goals there. So it's not just that we want to close the deal with those ones, we want to close the deal with better than those if we can. And we certainly want to close the deal with the door open um, to a more ambition. Um, so I think game theory, and Peter and others would do it better than I could, I think game theory would tell you, if you say these are our targets and then you put 150 conditions on them that need to be met, what you're signalling is I'm very cautious about this. I don't actually want to move very quickly. Uh, and I'm withdrawing the right to walk away from the negotiations at any point. Uh, and so, from that game theory perspective, I would come in and say, we need very, very straightforward, simple to articulate conditions. Uh, and we need them essentially uh, to take ourselves out of the game once we've declared our hand. You know, here's the formula, you apply the formula, you do what you like and we'll, we'll, we'll apply the formula to you. But we're not gonna leave in a lot of discretion. So that's where I'm heading. Uh, and then sort of the mechanics, what are the metrics and what are the base year? Uh, should we be the, the capital emissions? Um, should we go 1990, uh, like the EU 2000, as we currently are, 2005, like the US? Um, so, the, for those not familiar, and I suspect that's probably nobody in the room, uh, Australia has relatively high population growth um, compared to all the developing countries, you know, all developed countries, all high income countries. It would clearly make us look much cooler. Um, to, to frame our uh, commitments in terms of per capita emissions. Um, the counter argument is that our per capita emissions are, you might say, at the high end with the international perspective. Uh, and so I think it's a fairly straightforward thing just to say, play the game as everybody else is currently playing it and denote your target as an absolute term, uh, reduction from a, from a base year um, rather than as a per capita reduction. If you want to then go around and talk about per capita reductions, that's great. Um, but don't muck up the simplicity and elegance of your point. Uh, it also signals that Australia is willing to take <coughs> on you know, larger per capita reductions. They're willing to take on larger than average economic costs. I mean, our own modelling tells us the cost to Australia of achieving the target, any given target, any commensurate target, is much larger for Australia. 
numbers of times larger uh, than for the EU and other developed countries, but the incidence of targets varies significantly across countries. So that's the metric. Um, now, base year, I think, is a little bit more nuanced here, um, and it really goes back to the, the focus that I think I've already said um, of, on the US and the EU. Uh, and so the, the EU situation is that they had uh, coincidental emissions loss windfall between 1990 and 1995, with the UK uh, uh, shift out of coal into gas uh, and, and East Germany and, uh, and so forth. Um, so because of that circumstance of history, they really like 1990 as a base year. Uh, the US surprised itself uh, when its emissions uh, peaked and started trending down in 2006 or 2007, depending whether you're going uh, per capita emissions or total emissions. Uh, and so they quite like 2005, because that's their number. Um, uh, I suggest for tactical region reasons uh, that we don't pick a fight with our two people we're trying to persuade, and that we stick with 2,000 levels in the middle. Um, not persuading them that they should do the same, but it's just, just makes sense. Um, and so when you look at their commitments that the uh, EU range of 20 to 30 percent is equivalent to a 12 to 23 percent reduction on 2,000 levels, uh, and the US commitment to 17 percent below 2,005 levels is equivalent to a, a, a 16 percent reduction on 2,000 levels. Uh, it will clarification from Guyana is that he was suggesting that we do 16 percent to match the the, the, the US rebased to 2,000 levels. Um, but that, let me reflect on that, and so at the moment the, EU, the EU is committed to 12% below 2,000 levels, and the US is committed to more than that, which is not, I think, the vibe in public opinion. Um, the EU you know, is underperforming for that perspective, but we have different challenges here. So the EU is underperforming on ambition, and has a really good mechanism, should it ever choose to use it, um, whereas the US I wouldn't describe it as overperforming, it's performing better than the EU on its stated ambition. Uh, it has a history of not always living up to its commitments, and so the uncertainty there is will they deliver? Uh, uh, I, my judgment is they clearly have the capacity to deliver, it's feasible for them to do it, and I think it's feasible in a political sense for them to do it. It's not the least cost solution. Um, I think if you did an international survey, it would be very hard to discover a single country in any circumstance for any policy issue that has adopted the least cost position. Um, and so I don't think least cost is a big impediment. So, so from that perspective, I think that takes you down a chain of logic where my elegant solution is to say that Australia's target should be that we will do the greater of matching the US relative to 2020 or matching uh, the, the advanced country average. So the weighted average of all the advanced countries in 2000 add up their commitment for, for 2020. And if that's bigger than the US's, we'd do that instead. Um, and the maths of that effectively keeps the EU in play. So if the EU went to, um, to the 30% range, um, that would mean we're indifferent, I think, uh, on the maths. So I think it would be exactly the same answer um, pretty well in any other case. Uh, at 16%, but if either the EU or you know a group of other countries in the advanced countries, so Japan lifts its target, or if the US goes more, it, it would flow through to that community. So it's a very simple sort of mathematical formula. Uh, and in saying that, um, if I was clarifying, if somehow somebody got very drunk and pointed me to be the chief negotiator or something, um, uh, I would clarify that that's then an open-ended commitment for, for 2020. You know, if, if countries have the sort of epiphany that economics says that they should have, um, uh, Australia's target might end up being more than 25%. You know, that would be a marvellous outcome for Australia's <coughs> long run net present value of benefits from the climate negotiations. So there's nothing magic about 25, or it might get you to 18.7 or whatever it is. So, so I would strip that back. And I said before, I'm cautious about long lists of, um, of conditions in the sense that I think they undermine Australia's national interest in the negotiation. 
So clearly there's going to be a whole bunch of things where we want the negotiators doing a good job and making sure people aren't putting dodgy permits into the trading system uh, or whatever. But in terms of the high level thing, there are only two things which I would uh, have as red line issues in the negotiation. The first is that Australia needs access to high quality abatement through trade. Okay, so we need some sort of um, trading mechanism that, that delivers abatement in volume um, that we can rely on into the, into the future. Uh, because when I start talking about, you know, we're offering an uncapped uh, commitment to 32%, if that's what you guys agree to, we can't deliver that uh, at any sort of reasonable cost uh, without that sort of access to, to permits. And the second one is a little bit more cautious. I think given the legacy and baggage that we carry in the international negotiations, um, there is a danger of putting forward that sort of formula that takes us back into a two-track world that you know, Australia only cares about comparing itself uh, to developing, uh, to developed, to high income countries. Uh, and somehow, you know, that implies that Australia thinks high income countries can solve this problem by themselves, and that's just nonsense. And so my other condition would be some woolly words around, we need lots of people in the tent. Uh, I tend to think of the math economies, the major and this forum, uh, economies of, as who we want in the tent. Uh, but even then, I get a bit cautious uh, because I think there's a very real prospect that there will be two countries in that tent, uh, in particular India and Russia, uh, who may, for their own historical reasons, uh, essentially end up not playing ball. Uh, and I wouldn't want Australia to frame a condition where if those two countries decide to take their backs and go home, that we somehow have ruled ourselves out of participating. And so I would find some clever weasel words about, you know, broad-based participation that if we had to, without making fuss about it later on, we could say, well, we have brought in, even though those two members of the BRICS uh, have, uh, have chosen to do something different. Uh, so my last, last comments then move out of the 2020 space into the 2050 space and go back to the graph, which you may have to imagine uh, if you're not hopefully sitting there thinking about polar bears and penguins and, and <laughs> other images. Um, uh, it, it goes to the longer term uh, goal thing. Uh, this is not something that I have spent nearly as much uh, intellectual or emotional effort wondering about the detail of how to do it. Um, but essentially the, the arguments in favour of framing a 2020 target uh, relative to a recently recent base year are all about transition and you know transparency okay so transition if you happen to be like australia and you supply other countries with a whole bunch of uh, emissions intensive stuff versus if you happen to be like the uk and you know your net emissions are increasing but because of things you're consuming rather than things you're producing at home um, starting from a recent historical base you deals with those issues quite nicely it allows countries to make differentiated commitments based on capacity and enthusiasm. Um, that logic, in my view, falls away by the time you get to 2050. All right, so framing a discussion around what, it, what commitment are you prepared to take on in 2050 relative to 1990 or relative to 2000, uh, I think has very poor sort of emotional logic to it, okay? We can build the whole power system run it to the ground, shut it down, and be halfway through building the next one by the time we get to 2050. I mean, the transition uh, should be fully complete. Uh, if we've got a world where it's worth having a target, uh, there will be implicit or explicit carbon prices uh, through the entire planet and so forth. So <clears throat> while I'm not saying we should dump the current target, which is framed in terms of a reduction from a historical year, um, I don't actually think it's very prospective way forward in the international negotiations. Uh, and it has the other ba baggage that it's still all about cost. It's still all about reductions from a previous level. Uh, and so I would give serious consideration uh, to, to framing a, a, a target discussion for 2050 among high income countries, which is framed as an, in an entitlement basis. So that um, advanced countries should be moving to a level of whatever it is. 100% of the projected global average, or 80% of the projected 
the projected global average per capita emissions by that time frame. So I don't have specific uh, numbers in mind. I am confident that whatever numbers we agree uh, will be much too high and will need to be revised downwards over time uh, as we uh, realise the seriousness of the endeavour that we're actually engaged in. Uh, and so I'm more concerned about the framing and the way to think about it. Um, I think the other, the other part of that goes back to exactly what Will highlighted, but I think some of the, the equity issues which will be and should be, in my view, uh, more to the fore in talking about a 2050 target, will be easy to manage. Okay, so I have, I, I think the notion, for example, of development space uh, in emissions is complete nonsense. It's just so long-headed that you can't imagine how stupid it is. Um, but me knowing that doesn't mean people are going to stop thinking like that or talking about it. And I think a discussion around development space and entitlements where we signal that we're transitioning to a more entitlement-based view of what 2050 should look like, um, but also a view of what 2050 should look like in terms of per capita emissions that are very different from current levels, um, would be a constructive uh, input for Australia to make and that's you know, something for the, the Climate Change Authority would be considering. And that's it. Okay, time for questions uh, and answers. So I'm hoping this can be quite a free-flowing uh, conversation. Uh, just two things. We, we are recording the, the Q&A session for our website to have this online. If you do not want your question to be online, then please let us know and we'll edit it out. What if I make a mistake in my answer? Yeah, I mean, we'll, <laughs> bad luck. Yeah, that's, that's bad luck for you because I think you've already signed the release. <laughs> Unless you are all them. Okay. Um, and the second thing I wanted to ask, just the first time you make an intervention, just let us know who you are. And I'll start with you. Um, I'm Rebecca from the Solar Group here at ANU. Uh, thanks for all your presentations. I have a question for um, So you were talking about the cost benefit ratio of acting on time and it would be 10 times better to act earlier than, than later. But then you said uh, you were talking about having trade access to high quality abatement. So I'm not sure those two things, unless I've missed something, I'm not sure those two things match up because if you're sending all of your abatement offshore or a large proportion of it, where are you getting your cost reduction? In renewable energy and the skills upgrading and things like that. Okay, thanks Rebecca, that's a, a fair question. So the, the 10 to 1 ratio is about the net benefits to the globe of acting versus not acting. Um, so, and uh, one of the big insights from Ghana was that essentially a, a two degree world dominates a three degree world or a four degree world. The, benef the difference in benefits between two and three degrees is massive. And so while it costs more to get there, uh, the value proposition is much greater. And then the delay issue is, a, is more of a doubling issue rather than a, a, a one to 10 issue. It costs you at least twice as much. That particular style of model that gives you that number I'm not as fond of with, but the magnitude is probably about right. Um, so five years of delay doubles the permanent long run cost of achieving uh, a, a given emissions target. So uh, for me, the main trade issues uh, arise from the fact that different countries start at different points. Okay, so Australia has the strongest population growth in the rich world. Um, we've still uh, got a whole bunch of coal-fired power plants which for a long time will supply a very large share of our energy. And so for us to rapidly decarbonise energy, we have to shut plants we've already built. You know, they've got a lot of concrete and steel and all the rest of already in them. Um, and build new things, wind turbines and so forth. And it's cheaper for us to bridge this gap, so this is the gap from today to 2035 or thereabouts, by getting other people not to build coal-fired power plants rather than shutting our own. So a lot of this is about starting in a heterogeneous world where people are starting from different positions on the real race. race. Um, and, I, I, and I think you're right that over time, you know, by the time we get to 2040 or 2050, uh, emissions trade may be, in fact, much less significant and the requirement for it may wither. Um, 
but to get out of the blocks quickly, as, as I think the science tells us we need to do, uh, it will be much more important. And, and as an indication of that, nobody's done this in Australia for a while because we all, all the econ economics profession just assumes we'll have access to trade. Um, but you would guess that the, the carbon price would probably be about three times as high uh, for Australia to meet the sort of targets we're talking about without access to permits. And remembering that that makes absolutely no difference to the atmosphere, um, that's a lot of extra money to pay. Um, so I, I do think we need bridging access to, to quality abatement, but I describe it that way because it's not buying indulgences, it's getting genuine action, it just happens to be somewhere else. Um, I think I just really highlights that issue that um, we said we wanted to have a discussion on in our report, this issue of reliance on international trade. So Steve's highlighted advantages, the atmosphere doesn't care, it means you might be able to afford to take, you know, feel more comfortable about taking on a more ambitious target because it won't cost you as much to do so because you can trade. Other people, certainly in our discussions that we've been going around talking to people, have raised um, what they see as risks associated with that. We'll say, well, what if uh, we don't do much transition in our own economy for a long period of time and then the world changes around us and all of a sudden these, these international units that we were buying all of a sudden become tremendously expensive. So again, that's one of the things we want. We want people to start discussing, you know, what, are, what do we think the probabilities of that actually happening are and what, what would the costs be? Would it make sense, or would it actually, even if that happened, actually we, you know, still would have been better off, still cheaper overall to have uh, actually still relied on uh, a lot of international trade in the shorter term. So um, they're exactly the sorts of things that we want to be looking at, and we want people to be talking about. And, and for clarity, you know, I'm on record as saying we should have a price floor or something to make sure that we are doing we're doing genuine stuff at home, and we're taking the high power cost of it. I just, yeah, I support what Steve said. I mean, I think it's really just... Uh, you can I'll stop talking. This is on. Um, there we go. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say anything. I was going to say, basically, WRSU is that, that, uh, that Australia can show leadership by taking on a strong and ambitious target for 2020. And if trade helps us take on a stronger target, then, then that's a great thing. Um, however, my view also strongly is that, that Australia can show leadership by transitioning our economy as well. So uh, if we keep turning up at the international negotiations with a strong target, but the emissions domestically are still going up, um, countries don't sort of see that disconnect and, and scratch their head sort of thing. So if we can shift from being a high carbon economy to a low carbon economy and do that in a manageable way that doesn't, you know, kill the economy along the way sort of thing, then that's a pretty powerful um, demonstration to the rest of the world, particularly countries that are, that are sort of further down the development or further back down the development track or whatever, however you want to describe it. So. If you allow me just a footnote on the, on the cost-benefit question, I mean, there was frequent reference to the work done for the Ghana Review in 2008, and I think it is important to highlight the, the risk reduction function here. That you know the difference between three, two degree, or and two degrees, or even lower, for Australia would, to a very large extent, be uh, in uh, in an insurance function against possible very highly adverse uh, outcomes. And uh, very few of the modelling analyses that are out there and the quantifications really uh, cover cover that uh, properly at this, at this point in time. Oliver, thanks. Sir. Oliver Walgreen from Christine Mill's office. Question for Anthea. Just to clarify, does the authority welcome submissions from individuals or institutions who are in effect recommending uh, an emission reduction target that is more stringent for the year 2050 than the current target? Uh, we um, accept and will thoroughly welcome submissions on all aspects of our review, so yes. So, so just to be clear, though, you, you are open to recommending a target that is more stringent than the current target? We said in our issues paper that we would take the 2050 target as an anchor point. So uh, our current thinking has been that uh, this doesn't really rule anything out in terms of uh, global carbon budgets or uh, all sorts of things because you can, as a matter of arithmetic, you can shape things to... With, so that can be consistent with all sorts of different paths. So our view had been that it's not terribly worth perhaps getting Mickers in a knot at this point about something that is actually, um, Parliament has enshrined it uh, in the objects of the Clean Energy Act. 
So we also know that in our uh, 2016 review of the Clean Energy Act, we're explicitly um, required to review that target at that time anyway. So uh, if you had sort of um, pathways that you thought that actually the 80% was starting to look a bit funny um, because it implied a strange looking pathway to get there, that seemed like a time where that can certainly be brought up. So. We had looked at it as, a, as an anchor point, that said, and that's what we put in our issues paper, that said, it's an issues paper, it's not a final report. So certainly if people have got comments on that, we're happy to hear them. Okay. Andrew. Um, Andrew, thank you for uh, On that point, are, are you using KP accounting for your there's a number of issues here. We have been a little bit open in our in our um, issues paper and we have sort of asked the question really about how should whatever our recommendations um, be framed. I think we need to have something in relation to um, Kyoto Protocol accounting because at, at a minimum we would like uh, whatever we, we want something to be useful for um, when Australia comes back to inscribe its second commitment period, you know, um, commitment. So it's got a minimum offer on the table at the moment, uh, which is a 99.5% average of uh, 1990 emissions over the period 2013 to 2020. That's a minimum offer, uh, and that could be increased. So it, it would make sense to provide guidance that's useful um, to, to fit with that. We have asked the question in the issues paper whether we should be looking beyond you know, Kyoto Protocol uh, accounting um, and whether we need to, um, should, should we be looking beyond that for uh, any other uh, in sort of a nested um, uh, targets, carbon budgets um, set of arrangements. Uh, the reason I ask is I assume you take the 545 as you start number to 2000? Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but um, yeah, so the uh, KP accounting number, yes. Just under the legislation it says um, agency reduction of net emissions of 2000 and you've used KP, you've used KP, the number is actually 490 because you don't have the CF out of commitment period. I'll have to go back and have a look. We might have to take that conversation offline. So. What are you, what are you, I'm interested. What are you, 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 what are settled upon an approach yet, or just to make clear. But um, certainly, so people have discussed, you know, if it's looking at whether it's hard for you to reduce or easy for you to reduce and trying to take that into account. Um, so as Steve's pointed out and as you pointed out, but what about trade? So even if it's hard for you to do domestically, if you can buy it, should you make a contribution through trade in any event? Another thing is trying to get, if you wanted that as a rule that you wanted to sort of, you know, stand behind and take into na international negotiations, uh, I suppose another factor to look at is um, 
whether you would get any agreement. Presumably all countries would rock up saying it's terribly hard for me to reduce emissions. So, uh, so getting something that's um, relatively objective um, that can facilitate negotiations um, is something that you would also want to take into account. Right. Thanks. Um, the point was made by the was uh, concerned the significant number of uh, older coal fired power stations that have been um, abandoned in China. Um, the, the equivalent of Australia would be, I would presume, quite old coal, ground coal fired power stations in the Latro Valley. So, and that would seem to be important in the Australian equation. So I was mildly surprised to with Steve's comment that um, really there wasn't much room to move in the Australian electricity generating sector uh, when it comes to investment. Okay, if we're talking about the Nerebor question and uh, which, uh, which existing power stations are being used, what, what matters is the operating cost, including the fuel cost. If we're talking about new investment, then, um, then capital costs become a major consideration. So if we're looking at the capital cost of new coal-fired power stations, which in the case of brown coal power stations is very high, then um, it seems to me um, on the face of it that, um, that price of carbon emissions is going to have a very significant effect in deciding which, new, which technology is being used, is going to be used, to generate new electricity. And that's in the context of um, as we also noted, um, Australia was a country with um, a high population growth. So everything else being equal, one could expect uh, rapid growth in electricity consumption. Um, hence, uh, we are, we're talking about an investment issue here, choosing between rival and technologies in investment, not merely operational. Um, uh, would, would, now, would uh, Steve like to comment on that um, in the light of uh, what plans might exist or what we know about plans to um, uh, install generating capacity out of the next few decades? So I think we're in agreement. And I mean, the, the, the point about why it's useful or important for Australia to have access to trade is, is effectively that, um, you know, Carbon prices in a certain range will affect operational choices, um, but if if Australia doesn't have access to trade and is trying to achieve an ambitious target, you're going to have to go beyond operational existing capacity to you know shut down some high emissions capacity and open up new lower emissions capacity. So move from coal to gas or for, uh, uh, leapfrog uh, into renewables or nuclear or whatever it is that you would like to do that that has lower emissions profile. Um, and that's a transition issue that's linked to the age profile of the generator stock, and Australia has a very lumpy age profile with a whole pile of uh, coal-fired plants that were built around the same time and will last until roughly uh, 2030. So for, for my money, this is the sort of lay down the air argument for why you want uh, some access to trade. Doesn't mean you won't have other measures to make sure that you're still doing general uh, genuine transition, um, but it, uh, when you speak to sort of European academics uh, about these issues, and it goes in part to things like you know, straight line versus curved lines, um, the, the shape of those cur curves depends in part about uh, asset vintage and rollover in generation assets and those sorts of things um, uh, uh, as well. And if you've got a big stock with an evenly distributed age profile, then a sort of compound growth, negative compound growth curve that goes down makes a lot of sense. Um, but if you've got lumpy assets, it makes a lot less sense. So, um, I, I hope that's a useful comment, and I'm not quite sure what the question is. Yeah. Then let's take it back up to, to a macro level. Um, Barry just mentioned China and the sort of large or small program that, that, will, uh, that will get Chinese emissions intensity down coal fired. And Steve, you mentioned this issue of, of, of China's commitment actually exceeding, well, you mentioned it as well, what you know, a sort of Ghana review analysis would see as a 450 pathway. However, a situation very different for India and China. And so, Anthea, my question to you, right, so what, what is the, the, the sort of um, uh, the, the position that, that the authority might take in, 
in, in comparing different countries' actions. And you would see a basket of countries that, that look very, very different, right? And I know you, you told us that you know, you're know you not constrained by the government's conditions or the party or anything like that. Still, that's what has been kind of, um, I guess, framing the domestic debate. Um, and for memory, there's a fairly sort of general statement about you know developing countries making substantial taking substantial action for those foundations. How do you go about that disparity between different countries? I think the short answer is we'll tell you in October. We <laughs> a draft answer. Um, so that's something that we still um, need to look through. We're we're keen on getting people's views on what are the relevant comparators and why. So if we're wanting to look, you know, where we should sit in the pecking order. What pecking order are we talking about? Um, you know, who, who are we trying to influence? Uh, who are we influenced by? They're all decisions we haven't made yet. Uh, I suppose from my perspective here is that I, um, as I said, my presentation is crucial context for us to be sort of looking at other countries and sort of um, getting an assessment of where they're heading and whatever else. But we also need to avoid a this sort of situation becomes a bit of a, as one UN negotiator described to me once, it feels a bit like a comparathon sometimes where they, they turn up and they just sort of try and compare what they're not doing, <laughs> basically. And it gets a little bit depressing. There is a point where, uh, and I, I, I can you have a closer read of Steve's article and the, and the article, but there's a point where you sort of, you can think about paying a bit of a leadership premium, and I think that's what we'll be encouraging the authority to be thinking about as well, is that there is a, rather than just trying to sort of peg ourselves obsessively to, to sort of what's happening or what might be happening overseas, what is a sensible sort of leadership premium that we're willing to pay um, as, a, as a country, willing to take on, given <coughs> that we're a country that has so much to lose from unmitigated or, or a suboptimal mitigation policy globally? Uh, a more interesting question is, you know, what's the cost-benefit ratio of leadership? So, so we know in, in this market, it, the be returns to leadership are very high. So Apple took three quarters of the total profit in the mobile phone market last year. Uh, Samsung took 27% of the revenue. A few other people lost money. Um, so, so there, it's clear. You know, you do everything you can to be right at the front of the pack. Uh, for Australia, I think the question is actually a little bit more subtle about not the cost of leadership but the risks and returns of being at the front because what we we don't actually want to be out in front we want to take two steps forward and then find ourselves in the crowd um, so but that's a different that's a different conversation than currently happening in the negotiations and that's why for me this notion of stripping back the conditions saying that you know when we wrote this national interest statement that we think two degrees is good we really, really mean it. Uh, and that's partly because when you look at the science and what the, the next things we'll find out in the science over the next five to ten years, it'll be things like extreme events are currently, you know, essentially absent from the analysis. So none of the Stern, Nordhaus, all the rest of it, it hasn't got bushfires and floods. And, you know, we're at 7.7 7 a degree of warming at the moment. We're getting very material costs in Australia already from the events that are not included in the analysis, um, we really don't want to think about a four degree world. Uh, all our risks are skewed and the, the risks are not associated uh, with us being up near the front of the pack hoping to do a boat route. So for me, the issue is not uh, how much risk premium should we pay because the, the net benefit is very significant. It's how do we get people to take it seriously that when we say, we're prepared to pay this sort of cost, bear that sort of carbon price, undergo this sort of political pain, whatever it is, because it's in our long run interests and we are more exposed than other people uh, and we'd like you to join us on the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I think it's directed to Dylan oh, uh, McConnell from Melbourne Uni. Um, I think this is directed to India, uh, talking about risks. I'd be interested to know what the sort of approach is or how you're going to decide what acceptable levels of risk are. But the science, look, that fantastic factor that Steve mentioned, I think is based on about 60 or 60% uh, probability of extending it to 
and um, um, you know, what science can't tell you is what is that acceptable level of risk. And uh, to me, 60 60 percent is fairly bad odds. But um, I think you know, yeah, what what the sort of ideas around that are. Again, that's not something that we've settled on. So what the, what the world should be aiming for is its acceptable probability of achieving a particular temperature outcome. Um, one thing though, um, so keep an eye out on our website. So we have, we did invite a number of distinguished scientists to um, talk to us about exactly those sorts of issues uh, and about all sorts of things about global, sort of all things related to global carbon budgets basically. Uh, and um, so we'll be putting those presentations and um, a summary of, of those discussions on our website. So um, be keen for other people's views and um, hopefully uh, that'll um, those papers will help help you as as much as it's helped us. So. Oh, yeah, so, um, Nick from the Department of Innovation. This question is for um, Anthea. Um, given that some of the government's targets were set with the Treasury model much higher carbon price than now with the revisions to it, do you expect your um, CAPS recommendations out to 2020 to be much more ambitious than would otherwise um, be the case? And based on Perhaps differentiation between short term and medium term prices in Europe. Would the authority ever set a cap which was higher than the preceding year? If you were expecting oh, okay. a sort of short, short term cheap price, then the medium term a much higher price, and if you take into account sort of the economic cost of business, would you ever need in such a scenario? So in relation to what our cap recommendation and target recommendation is, we're not there yet, <laughs> we've got a way to go before we um, make recommendations about that. Uh, so different views about what future carbon prices might be there are, are of course a key input to um, the economic analysis that you need to do. Uh, usually if carbon price is lower, all the sorts of impacts uh, are lower. So if you're talking about you know, the impact on electricity prices, you're talking about the impact on particular industries. If you lower the carbon price, the lower those impacts might be. The corollary is, if you lower the carbon price, because those impacts are smaller, uh, less happens in your domestic economy. Um, people that don't face as high an incentive to, to modify behaviour, to, to change investments, all those sorts of things. Uh, and so that, that implies um, uh, lower costs and it does imply more um, purchases of units um, internationally. So that's, in broad brush, you know, be astounded if, um, you know, modelling didn't suggest those sorts of things. Future carbon prices are, of course, uncertain. Um, and so we'll be handling that through sensitivities. We want to look at a range of plausible um, scenarios for what carbon prices might be. And so, um, and so to be able to have a look at a, a range of possible things, so to test our recommendations and see, um, have a look at what the, what the costs and impacts might be under a range of different... Um, scenarios. In relation to the shape of the caps, there probably are some things to, to think about the shapes of the caps to, um, relevant to uh, any um, shape of any trajectory. So if you think about it as a, a little mini budget just to get you out to 2020. Um, so some of the things of that and this is getting a bit into the design of the emissions trading scheme, but so we can, Australia can purchase 12.5%, um, you know, liable parties can surrender up to 12.5% of their liability using um, Kyoto units, uh, in particular um, CER, so units created under the clean development mechanism. These are currently really cheap, so kind of 35 cents, I can't remember the latest, but uh, very cheap. Uh, and. And, and they can surrender up to 50% of their liabilities with um, other types of uh, international units, principally European Union allowances. And so uh, it potentially, you might want to think about that if you're thinking about the shape of caps about what might the implications be for what types of units get purchased and what kind, what sorts of units might be setting um, at the marginal price um, here in Australia. So. Anyway, so that, that's, they're interesting things that are worth um, thinking about. We've certainly come to no conclusions on those, but there, you know, there's potentially some things that you might want to think about um, about that, particularly in the very early years. So just to pick up on that point, so the Treasury modelling in 2011 assumed that there would be a large amount of purchases made at whatever, $29 a tonne, 
we, we're now on the current legislation in a situation and under current market conditions where the vast majority of those anticipated purchases might be made at cost at less than one dollar a ton. So don't even think about the EU price, but it is the CER price that will be making up a lot of what will be bought, you know, not at the margin, but the inframarginal purchases, so, so those costs might be dramatically lower. Um, we're near the end. Um, I just want to flag one issue that I'd like the panel to talk to before we go to Oliver again, um, and that is ethics. Uh, now, the IPCC, forthcoming third working group assessment report, for the first time we'll have a, a chapter on economics and ethics. Right? You've got a philosopher, ethicist on the board of the Climate Change Authority. You may not be able to, to tell us just what you know, the, the deliberations there are, but maybe you can speak a little bit, Anthea, to, to what the plans are for, for covering the what should we do from a principles-based uh, approach in, in, your, in your recommendations, and maybe any other comments that there are. Um, and uh, perhaps, Oliver, did you, did you want to jump in as well? Just, we? just following up <coughs> the conversation you just had about the modeling, the trillion modeling, is there any intention to update the trillion modeling? Uh, yes, so we're in that process now. In fact, there's a whole range of assumptions for that modeling process that are out for consultation now. Um, we're very keen for people to have a look at those. And if they've got any comments, uh, I'd be delighted to hear them, um, which would be great. So, now, so in relation um, to ethics and what we think about is fair, it's difficult, um, unlike many of the other reviews that we do, where a lot of the issues are really reasonably technical, you're normally worrying about kind of efficiency and effectiveness. You spend most of your time thinking about those kinds of concepts. When you're thinking about these, what should Australia's contribution to a global effort of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, it, it's, hard, it's hard to avoid, and I think if you, I think you might have mentioned it earlier, that um, it's difficult to, to try and avoid ethical issues. Uh, and even if you think you are, you're probably kidding yourself. So, um, so it, it does. It, it's, it's very hard to think about what should our share be, what should we aiming for in the long run, all of those sorts of things, without thinking about well, what does that mean between me and other countries, and, and is that fair? So, from the narrow perspective of can we send our negotiators in and argue for it? You know, they can't do that unless they can convince other people that it's fair. Uh, to a sort of broader perspective, you know, do we, do we care about what we think is fair? Do we think we're um, making a valid contribution? So there are issues. We haven't got a fully specked out way of how we're going to be thinking about those. But I think, I think it is. In, I think people are kidding themselves if they think that this is a purely, purely technical exercise. The other thing I'd say there is that I think um, an important role for the authority is to, to sort of start that conversation and, and try and um, provide some some foundations for that conversation because I, I the big question is how do we get our political leaders to sort of to, to participate in that conversation and to think about this from an ethical point of view um, uh, and you know from a from a range of other point of points of view as well and I think that's that's a real role for the authority there to sort of not only educate us as the public and academics whatever else but to try and um, reach out in some way to, to our political leaders and, and play a role there as that, that voice that is sort of injecting some of those considerations into the debate. Obviously the NGOs and others can play that role as well, but the authority um, does have a, a special place as being an independent body um, with, a, with a quite a diverse um, board and set of skills and perspectives. So, um, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing it. Last word, goes to Steve. Yeah, so... so I think ethics is foundational um, and it's a great deal more complicated than either Anthea has indicated. So at its foundation, you know, we live in a democracy and there's a constitutional requirement that the government reflect the interests of, of the Australian population, of citizens, and thus that our negotiating teams on whatever trade or whatever uh, reflect the interests of, of Australians, uh, you know, and is that fair? That it, that's how it is, and that's the obligations. And I think in Australia we we got to a watershed moment, you know, with the the first Ghana review, where we Australia as a country had spent a long time thinking of climate change as a threat to coal exports, essentially. I think you can find evidence in the parliamentary record for that. 
uh, and then from the Ghana review, we have shifted position to a position that says, you know, global action on climate change has implications for the Australian economy, but those implications are, are not small, but are manageable uh, and are less important than the end game of avoiding dangerous climate change globally. And I think that watershed moment in Australia's policy history means that now Australia's negotiating position is substantially aligned with most, most views about equity, about where the world should be going, what Australia should be doing. So I don't actually think there's a great deal of underlying conflict. And then you can get into very specific narratives about which particular philosopher do I like and how would they um, represent the ethical dimensions and let's write a thesis on it, which is fine. But uh, the end game, I think you'll find that Australia's number one ethical commitment is to deliver on what it says it's trying to do. Australia's number one ethical commitment is, is to do the hard stuff to help achieve a transformative global agreement. Um, and they're very few and far between. This is not an easy task. Okay, thank you very much everyone for being here and taking part in the discussion. I'm sure we'll be having these conversations again after the release of your draft report, which will also be after the election. Um, thanks very much to all three of you.